Oh, Lori, we've got some eager people ready for today's very oh, unique show. Yes, we do. And it is going to be a very unique one. You know, guys that are frequent flyers, it doesn't happen very often that you just have myself and Lauren. And today, you know, <laughs> and Lauren and I were talking before the show, and I said, you know what, I am going to, I've got some things I'm going to tell you, some things I'm going to share with you, but then I am going to be the guest. I was saying to Lauren, you know, I have the guests come on, and you have been guests, know this. I make you tell everything. I ask all these questions. You tell your story those have been around for a while I, we were recapping this morning we've had people cry several times on the show we've had the audience cry from the stories we've had laughter we had swear we've had everything right but I've always stayed in the back and said well Lori doesn't tell anything right so I thought you know what? I'm going to just be you know exposed today you guys can ask me anything you want about my entrepreneurial journey and I will tell you um I see Christine already has a question become an accredited investor how does one figure out their net worth oh my god christine you're asking you know huge freaking questions already oh my god this sounds good oh and and you know what i'm getting my thank you on the hair i'm getting my i hair, told her the same thing christine let me say that go ahead i'm getting my hair trimmed right after this see this piece i hate this piece i want that piece gone but you know guys um the i have had like this head of hair since before. okay we're telling stories i'll start already the day I came out of the womb, okay, we're going to go back that far right now. The pictures are hilarious. I had hair way down to my shoulders and it was jet black. So this has been my, my, um, what did they, oh yeah, my friends, when I was in my twenties, they used to call it my mane. <laughs> <laughs> and all I got to do is just kind of like do something to it and it does it. Now, other things I fight with, but the hair, I just kind of wrestle and make it do something. But anyway, <laughs> you know what, Lauren, they're already asking questions. So let's let's get going and you're going to hear a whole bunch of information and I'm going to answer the questions I best I can. And I'm already going to say if the questions are more intense than I can answer in this setting, I'm going to say get in touch with Lauren schedule an appointment. We will talk about it in more detail. And some of them I may have to research. I know you guys think I'm brilliant on every <laughs> topic, but there's things I don't know too, okay? Okay, Morgan, <laughs> start us off. Let's get going here. All right. I am going to share my screen, but while I do that, uh, let me let uh, both Christine and Maggie, thank you so much. They commented on my hair as well. Uh, you know, a, com a compliment goes a long way. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're both having good hair day. Yay! <laughs> you ladies are making our day for sure. <laughs> Let me go ahead and get our um, deck going because we are going to dive into a really juicy uh, and of course, informative show. So good morning to everyone. My name is Lauren Simpson. I am with the SBDC or the Small Business Development Center. We are a national program with over a thousand locations across the country, and we offer no cost services to local small businesses. Now our services are at no cost to you because your tax dollars have already taken care of our fees. Now, as it relates to the Los Angeles uh, regional keep in mind regional, regional center network. Uh, we have several locations and you can see those by the redway marks on the map in front of you. We have physical center locations in Camarillo, a location in Santa Clarita, Pasadena, all the way out to Laverne throughout Los Angeles, the South Bay down into Long Beach. Now you'll notice that those uh, centers represent a certain county or area. Uh, keep in mind that we serve Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Now, I had mentioned services that we offer. Again, at no cost, you'll see that we offer business advising. And so that's your opportunity to sit one-on-one -on -one with one of our experts or business experts. Um, now we have experts in various fields from everything from uh, marketing, uh, if you're just starting out and looking to create a business plan uh, or just going over, you know, like the ideation process, we have someone who can help you with that. Uh, we have experts in finance and taxes. Uh, we actually have a guru of numbers, Miss Lori Williams with the great hair today. Uh, and, we, <laughs> and we also offer virtual trainings. Now, those trainings are going to be comprehensive workshops that assist you in beginning your business, adapting and or growing. 
So go ahead and get in contact with us. We'd love to get started with you today. You can contact us by phone, 866-588-7232 or online, smallbizla.org forward slash new client. You can also go to americasbdc.org, find your SBDC. If you have reached us and you are outside of our service area, that means that you are outside of the Los Angeles, Santa Barbara or Ventura counties. So I'm gonna stop my screen share before we jump into the show, uh, Lori, quick housekeeping. Today is a Q&A with Lori. And so be sure to put all your questions. We did receive a few emails, so Lori has those. But be sure to put all your questions into the Q&A. I will be monitoring the chat for any questions and we'll pose those to Lori throughout the show. Uh, but again, let's put those in the Q&A. Um, back to the chat. Be sure to check out the chat for useful links. There are gonna be links to... Uh, various uh, webinars that Lori is going to be hosting as well as a link to our YouTube playlist where you can see past shows. And then also Lori had mentioned my email address. Please get in contact. If you would like to get in contact with Lori, you can shoot me an email. Again, take a look at the chat and I'll plug that in in just a second. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Lori. Awesome. You know, I was also talking with Lauren earlier. I love the way Zoom makes you look. I use that fix appearance <laughs> and that's like an immediate fix your blemishes, everything. So if anybody's on Zoom all the time, click that button. You'll look a lot better. I always say I wish I look as good a person as I look on Zoom. Anyway, I'm going to go over a quick thing. Lauren's going to put the links into the chat. I've got the legal structure and tax advantages coming up. I I know that's a very popular webinar. I love giving that webinar because there is so much confusion and incorrectness about legal structures out there every day. In fact, I was having a conversation yesterday and it's a typical conversation where somebody says, hey, I you know, started an LLC so I can be taxed differently. I'm like, oh no, it's same as a sole prop. We'll talk about that if we have time today. And I also you know, get these well in S Corp and everything. So much out there that's not correct. So if you're having any questions, please um, take a look at that webinar. Repeating the financial literacy series. This is still a hot series going on. Two and three is going to be a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today, give some examples of some things, but that is there every month. It's not recorded, but it's there every month. Upcoming shows next week, we got Leo and Chris, and I switched out Leo and Chris and just put your name. So Leo, if you're in there, I, I know you're the CEO. I wanted to fit both of your names on the form today. So I just said Leo and Chris, but they are really two young, inspiring entrepreneurs, full of energy, full of ideas, full of creativity. Great story. Join us next week. I'm real excited to have them on the show. And then the following week, I have Simara coming back on. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Solvit HR, also an advisor at the Pasadena SBDC. Shout out to Annie right now. And she's just so wonderful and up to date on all of the HR laws, which there are new ones that are coming in, or I should say have already come into play in January. Also want to touch a little bit on AB5. But I told Samara, I said, let's have a conversation of what happens when you go from zero zero to one employee. Because of AB5, many are having to do that. So let's walk through the processes. Let's walk through the extra costs. Let's walk through what exactly happens. So that's going to be a really interesting topic. And then today we're going to go through, here's my long list, okay? I don't know how much we're going to get through. I'm letting you guys direct it, but I'm going to talk a little bit and I've got some demonstrations. I don't, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet, but it's not a teaching. It's more of a demonstration demonstration so you understand what I'm talking about. So I'm going to answer things like why you cannot view internal accounting reports for profitability. I talk about that all the time, but I, I want to show you guys and, and help you understand what I mean by that. And then I always say, you have to at least know some things about your company and profitability is really important. I'm going to demonstrate what you need to know. Why gross profit matters, especially for each product and service sold? I'm going to show you what I call a blended rate. And then all of this is going to explain the thing I say to you guys all the time. You do not want to be more tired and more broke. So like I said, depending on where your questions go, these are some of the things I have that I can demonstrate. I'm trying to show you what more tired and more broke looks like. Also storytelling. We can talk about why LLCs are taxed like sold 
little props. And like I said, I'll be an open book on my entrepreneurial journey. So we'll we'll go through that as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Christine's on what how does one become an accredited investor? Now, Christine, as you probably thought, that is something that we would have to talk online. One, it's a process. Two, it's something that I have to look back because the rules have changed over the years. And I'm talking about old rules. So it's my memory. At one point in time, and I think it's a bigger number now, but in order to be an accredited investor, you had to, I think the number was like 100,000. You have to have a certain amount of money or make a certain amount of money. I don't know the up-to-date numbers, but I'll tell you the concept behind it. The government wanted to make sure that you know, I shouldn't say make sure they were trying to make sure, I guess, that anybody who is an accredited investor investing in companies has a certain amount of can I use an old fashioned saying wherewithal, if you will. And so they tried to attach that to earnings. So that at one time, I think they had 100,000 salary, if it was a spouse, 200,000, they had certain requirements, which they still have in place. I just don't know the most recent number. So you have to meet the financial requirements to be an accredited investor. That's where that comes from. And how does one figure out their net worth? They just really start looking at, you know, how much cash do they have, what their home would be worth right now. Now, what their car would be worth right now. In a personal financial statement, it's abbreviated PFS. That is what a bank requires that you pay, you fill out when you get a loan many times. And it looks at even things as how much jewelry do you have? So some things you would be estimating on the value if it was to be sold. So you have to do a valuation or estimate. Some things like cash 401 are estimated on what they are there. But it's just a matter of tallying up everything that's worth money and identifying identifying what it is and the total to find your net worth. Now, I want to go into one more question before I go into anything else. And that is Brenda, a shout out to Brenda. She was sent me an email with several different questions and I want to answer them. So I'm going to read out some of the questions. Uh, pros and cons of business loans versus line of credit. So the pros and cons, I want to kind of change it, Brenda, from the word pros and cons. It's more about what we call usage of funds, usage of funds. When a person goes into a bank and tells a banker, I want a loan, I want a line of credit, they start explaining what they want. The banker identifies what the use of funds are. The reason being is it's the banker's responsibility to make sure during the underwriting, they are, let's say, using the right product or a line of credit or a loan is what I mean by product, using the right product and matching it to what would be the usage. So let's pretend for a second that you're wanting to buy inventory and you're buying excess inventory because it's sold during Christmas time. And then by the next, you know, several months after Christmas and then, you know, December, January, February, you collected the funds from the selling of that inventory. It really is the usage of funds is to borrow money on a short-term basis to buy inventory, and then the payment back of that credit line is from the inventory sold. So they don't want a five-year term loan for that because you'd be spending the money, you know, along the way. So the credit union or the credit line, I mean, allows you to borrow an amount of money for a short-term use. And it could be also cover, you know, working capital during the time when you're waiting for receivable payments to come in, all of these different types of short-term use is a line of credit. Now, when I was a CFO in companies and still, you know, do interim CFO every once in a while, you strive to get a line of credit because it gives your company flexibility and access to funds. But a line of credit has written into the covenants that it has to be paid down once a year. So let's say that you want to buy a piece of equipment or you're trying to do some long-term funding. You don't want to have to pay it down to zero in a year. And that's when a term loan comes in. So these products are for different purposes, depending on the usage of the funds. And the banker works with you to identify. Well, actually, I say the banker identifies. They will not put you in a product that does not fit with the usage of funds. But that is the pros and cons of the loan versus the uses of funds. Now, Brenda asked a really interesting question, and it's a good one. And we should talk about this more, Lauren. Is the SBDC part of the SBA? Yes, it is. So what happens is it's part of the government funding 
there is money allocated to help small businesses educate, advise, et cetera. And that money gets filtered through what we call the small business development centers that are out throughout United States in all different areas. And then they get filtered through these different areas to be feet on the street, so to speak, to work with the small businesses. So the SBA, that it is engaged in many different activities from the FEMA funding to the funding like you saw with COVID to the small business loans, where the SBDC is more of the one-on-one -on -one working directly with the business and part of the funds are received through and of the SBA. Now, with that being said, the it's definitely part of, but it's not like I'm sitting right next to the SBA individuals. And so we have information we gather from them, but we're not sitting side by side. It's one of those offshoots that has a little bit of a distance between the organizations. And that's why, you know, when we look at SBA funding and everything, you maybe don't have somebody that you can call directly at the SBA that's your best friend, but it is part of it, if that makes sense. Now, you also ask what kind of loan are best for minority women-owned businesses, really it comes down to the usage of funds. So although there may be an ability to get a grant or something based on being a minority business, et cetera, when it comes to what type of loans, they cross all platforms. There's low interest loans, there's high interest loans, there's credit lines like we just talked about, there's using your credit card. The truth is always the truth on them, independent of who's borrowing the money. Lower interest rate is better, right? A credit line is good to have. A term loan is better when you have a longer loan. You know, it's so it really is these products have their purpose, they have their usage, they have their benefits, and it crosses all platforms. Now, you also asked about how many hours are considered part-time and the pros and cons of hiring. Zimara is going to be on, as I said, in two weeks, and I am going to let her be the resident expert, and she is going to answer those questions for us, Brenda, because she's going to walk through that. And I used to talk a bit on HR, but to be honest with you, HR scares me. It's become so complicated over the years, and there's so many changes in it that with when Zimara came on board, once again, shout out to Pasadena SBDC for your brilliance in bringing her on as an advisor, because once she came there, I'm always like, let's go to Samara. She's keeping up on all of it. So I'm going to pass that since she's coming on in two weeks. Otherwise, I would have gotten the information from her and made sure I had the most recent. But I'm going to let her go ahead and answer that. So what I'm going to do real quick, and like I said, if you got a question, make sure it goes in the Q&A. I don't always see things in the chat. Lauren's going to try to move questions into the Q&A, but the chat kind of goes through really quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick sharing of something, and that gives you some time to put anything you want into the Q&A for me to answer. And I'm going to just show you some things. Now, these are demonstrations. Remember, these are demonstrations. It's not teaching. It's a demonstration. But I'm going to to try to demonstrate some of the things I've said before. I'm getting this all centered for you. So it makes sense, okay? I'm gonna go slow, guys. I tell you all the time that your internal accounting documents cannot tell you profitability. Now, why do I say that? Well, your internal accounting documents are reported on what's called a cash basis. All companies, 26 million or below, which I think that's everybody on our call, right? 26 million or below must, by IRS rules, report on a cash basis. So what does that mean? Cash in, cash out. So I want you right now to think about your bank statement. I want you to look at your bank statement in your mind's eye. When you look at your bank statement, be it for a month, you see what cash came in and what cash came out. Now, the cash that came in could be directly related to a sale you just made, or you could have outstanding receivables, like I have outstanding receivables right now. So I've done the work months ago, but that cash is not in my bank account yet, right? So that doesn't count on my internal accounting. Because think about it, you're downloading your data into your accounting software from where, guys? Your bank statement. So it's not looking in and saying, well, what is your accounts receivables that's being paid? It's looking at your cash. Now, I know you can click the accrual button, but it's not the same. It's you got to input the data differently, right? So when we look at our internal accounting, when we look at our tax returns, it's all on a cash basis. 
And therefore, this is why you cannot tell from your internal accounting documents whether or not you're profitable. Now, I'm going to tell you a story behind the scenes because today's storytelling day. When I, when I had my you know company, I started my first company at 25, and I was the warm, fuzzy marketing person. I was not the finance person. I literally went down the finance pathway because I just could not understand the whether or not I was financially profitable. And I talked to the CPA. They couldn't tell me. I read all these books. They couldn't tell me. And so it just kept pushing me to try to understand things more. When I don't understand something, my personality is, especially if it affects me, I can get really fearful. And I'm like, instead of letting fear take over, I'm like, well, damn it, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to know it. That's how I am, right? And I tend to jump full force into everything. So I you know, said, I'm going to get more educated on finance. I ended up going back to school and studying finance. I became a banker, all these things just to understand finance, right? And so by the time I did, then I was involved in turnarounds, going into big companies that were having problems. I was a banker. I was involved with the investment bankers. And when I got to that other side, walked down that long pathway of not understanding and got to the other side, I was like, oh my God, I now know what I didn't know. But I also know that there's no way I could have derived this because you really got to look at numbers differently. I was working with companies with bigger software. Some of them were using accrual accounting. It was a whole different world. But then I struggled for many years because I said, well, you can't really take an internal accounting system from a cash basis and no profitability. And so it this is why it's not done. But then my next train of thoughts, I'm just kind of opening up my heart and telling you my internal thoughts was, but wait a minute, these small companies are investing their own money. They, they're no longer simple. They're not on cash anymore. They're using all the payment terms and, and they don't know whether they're profitable. There's got to be a way to make this work. So I struggled for many years with different models and different methodology because I didn't want to take somebody that did cash-based accounting and move them to real confusing accrual accounting. You don't do that. I mean, it's a good thing, guys, that the IRS doesn't require companies 26 million or less because accrual accounting is complicated. You need a staff, you need all these spreadsheets. It's nasty right? But what I did, and I think, you know, and I remember the moment in my life, this is decades ago when I thought about this, the reason why I was able to kind of break the keys and figure out what it was that you could do was because I didn't start out in finance. If I would have started out in finance, I would not have allowed myself to distort the accounting rules like I was to figure it out because I thought to myself, what if I just take a little bit of accounting in accrual, just a tiny bit, and then blend it with a little bit of cash and mix it all up? What could I come up with? Well, anybody that started out in accounting would be like, you don't do that. But I was kind of like, well, I'm marketing. I'm creative. I'm a writer. Let me mix up my finance. Let me imagine this. And I played with it a lot. And then I came up with, wow, I got it. I knew what I could do. I could take one principle. And that's right here, guys, the matching principle. I could take one principle. And that is taking the selling price of one unit and the cost of one unit and not extracting that data from the internal accounting system, but make somebody identify how much did I sell during the year, what price, and how many was the quantity, right? And if I did that and that only, I could change the dynamics. I was like, wow, I could really change the dynamics. So what I did is I said, I'm going to change and take the matching principle from this and only the matching principle. And I'm going to make a few more minor changes throughout that will just kind of change the dynamics of this. And so what I did, and I'm demonstrating it here. So I want you guys to just look up here. Okay, just look up here and you see that the selling price of one unit is $15. The cost of one unit is $8. So what I'm doing is I'm using this number and I identified, well, how many units were sold in a month? Well, 100 was sold. 
how much inventory was purchased. I'm going to explain this number in a second. Well, the inventory purchased was 5,000, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an income statement based on cash accounting. Then I'm going to create my slightly modified playing with the numbers, um, breaking some of the rules, a little bit, you know, outrageous income statement, and I'll show you what happens. So let's take $15 for a unit sold, one unit sold, time 100 units sold, and come up with a number for revenue. 1500 Easy, right? Well, let's do this little matching principle. $8 is what the cost of a unit is. Let's multiply that times 100, and we've got, um, oh, so sorry, so sorry, so sorry. Um, back up for a second. I'm on the, the um, cash one. Because we've got 5,000, we're looking at how much inventory was purchased. We're looking at the exact dollar amount purchased, right? So you can see that all of a sudden, as I say, wait a minute, the cost of the unit was eight times the number of units sold, it should be 800, but it's 5,000, why? Because how much cash came out of the bank account? It was 5,000. So when we look at that, we go, wait a minute, that's not right. Let's play with it. Let's do it over here and let's follow. Okay, 1,500 times 15 units sold. And then let's take $8 times 100 units sold. And let's do the matching principle right here. Let's do the matching principle, right? So over here, we got cash-based accounting. I purchased the inventory out of the bank account. I got paid already for the revenue because I did it on MasterCard, right? This is what it's gonna show on my bank statement. This is what I fixed it to look like. Now, when it comes to the insurance and different things, like maybe I paid a check for the insurance because it was due in July. So I wrote a whole check for 180, right? Well, instead of doing that, I'm gonna divide it by 12 and say how much was used per month. If I know that the rent was 50, I'm gonna multiply it by 12. When I look at the cash-based accounting, it tells me I lost $4,255. That's not true. Now let's go a month from now. I already purchased inventory. I don't need to purchase inventory, so it's zero. Now it's gonna tell me I made 745. Neither of those numbers are correct. Neither of the numbers are correct. But if I go here and I follow my format, it says I have a net income of 410 and I have 5,000 left on the balance sheet. So what happens is the way I distorted the information is I extract it from accounting systems, invoices, everything. And I work with clients that do this all day long. I recreate a partial based accrual accounting document where I can start to say, how much is your net income in actuality? I can't look at the financial accounting, but I can look at my reconstructed income statement to get a better feel. And from there, I can take it down some really interesting path roads. So first of all, if anybody's got comments, did you follow on what I said? I kind of you know, went over here a little bit and over there, so I didn't mean to lose you. But did you follow on the fact that I had to take the numbers out? I had to do a matching principle. And in that, I reconstructed a partially based accrual accounting that makes more sense. Okay, do you guys got me? Do I got a thumb up? Did I lose you? You got me on that? So if I do that, look what's the cool thing I can do. Um, I don't understand how you got the 5,000 for the cost. Good point. So if I purchase inventory and I pay a check for the 5,000, so I purchase inventory and I pay a check for 5,000, I want you to, everybody picture your bank account. I wrote a check for 5,000, I purchased the inventory. What's gonna happen on the withdrawals of the bank account? It's gonna show 5,000 out, out of the bank account, right? So if I look at my internal accounting, it's gonna show a number here saying 5,000. So it's going to show basically the cash that came in, how much I sold, the cash that came out, what inventory I bought, and that's where the error is. But instead, if I do in calculation and I say, well, how many units did I actually sell, which is part of what happens in accrual accounting, I get a complete different answer that is more correct because this is the actual money from the number of units sold. You can see the hundreds 
lit up. This is the actual cost from 100. I followed the matching principle. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is creating a more un better understanding from a accounting perspective of what really happened in that month. Now, keep in mind, guys, keep in mind, I'm not trying to use this to report to a bank. I'm not using this for financial accounting. I am doing this internally to have a much better understanding of where I am financially. This is a back of an envelope that gives me a clue, okay? So guys, if you got any questions or don't understand this, because I'm going to show you a really cool friggin' trick in one second. So if you've got any questions or don't get what I just said, or at least have a clue, please put it in the Q&A. But you see, I have just kind of manipulated the numbers. They're actual numbers, but I've created this little neater chart, right? Okay, now we're going to do a cool trick. You ready? This is something that everybody should know. How many widgets must you sell to reach a dollar profit? You know this break-even concept? People calculate it incorrectly. This is how I look at it. So all I did is I picked up the same numbers. $15 to sell one unit, $8 cost to make one unit. I did a, ma a mathematical calculation. So 15 minus eight is seven gross profit. $7 is the gross profit. And yes, Christine, I did purchase more inventory sold. That's absolutely correct. Yes, you got that. That's absolutely correct, which is common. We don't just purchase inventory every time we sell it. We purchase inventory. We pay for insurance for the whole year. We do a lot of things that we pay for that are not about the month. That's why your cash-based um, accounting documents are so incorrect. Okay, let me stay on this and then I'm going to come back to you, Robert. So you can see all I did was I said, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm selling it for one, I'm selling it for 15. It cost eight, it's gross profit of seven, right? So now what I'm doing is I'm making this where I put the information together. Here's my overhead, which you saw a minute ago. Here's my overhead. Here is my revenue. And this is the number of units sold. Let's put a zero here first, guys. And you see, I forced this to match. I forced this to match. So if I sell, remember the little arrow matching principle? If I sell none, it costs me none, okay? Because I'm looking at this differently than I would be looking at it in my internal accounting because I'm doing an analysis. I'm doing an analysis of the situation. Now, you can see that if I sell nothing, it costs me nothing to produce, but I have overhead of 510, I have a negative 510, right? Check this out. I can say, how many widgets must I sell to be a dollar profit? Well, I can put numbers in. Is it 89? Oh, let me get 89 in there. Is it 89? I don't know. Let me see. Well, look, yes, I'm $113. So I have to sell 89 units. Um, could I sell 86? You know, I can keep playing with this and I can get down to 92. And I can look at the gross profit and say, wow, it's 47% gross profit. This is really interesting. So like I said, this is not a training. This is an aha. It gives you an idea of how you can play with these numbers. If anything, makes you a little interested to say, wait a minute, Lori's got some cool tools. Maybe, you know, I need to know about these. So if somebody just bring, brings up to me their business model and I'm first looking at it, I can look at it immediately and see, well, what is the structure? What is the cost structure? What will it require? for this company to be profitable and profitable is net income. This is where you buy a quart of milk, guys. You don't buy a quart of milk over here. People talk about revenue all the time. Revenue is not where you buy a quart of milk. You buy a quart of milk. In other words, pay for your personal expenses right here. So now I can turn around and I could say, I want to have a benchmark. And I these are small numbers just to make up, right? Say I want to make where at least I want to have net income of 1500 a month. I would want to have net income 1500 a month, right? Then I could say, well, how many units do I have to sell to reach that? Is it 350? Well, no, I don't need to sell 350. 335 maybe, you know, maybe about 300 would do, right? So now I know the, the number to reach my benchmark. And when you look at this, you want to look at it and you want to speak like this. You don't want to just say, my revenue is, um, I'm selling it for this. You want to do a full sentence because 
it is the relationship, the alignment. It's holistic, just like the body. The body, if the mind's not feeling good, the health's not feeling good. If you, you know, got a bruise on your finger, your whole body's affected. You know, the body's holistic. And counting in numbers are holistic. Business models are holistic in the same way, guys. So when you look at this, you say, if I sell it for $15 and it costs $8, and I sell 300 with total expenses of 510, then I'll have five, 1,590 if I sell the 300 units. So you want to understand these full sentences. Now, you also have to be real. I always talk about it. You have to be real. You can't be delusional. I need to say, well, for me to sell 300 units, can I sell it with these expenses? This is where you got to go into an Einstein thought experiment where Einstein imagined what it was like to ride a beam of light. You know, and then people say, well, I can't imagine what it would be like to sell. No, if Einstein can imagine riding a beam of light, you can do an Einstein thought experiment. You look in your mind's eye and you see your company selling 300 widgets and you look for, well, is can can just one person do it? Can I do it on my own? Is this marketing going to be able to help me to get 300 units? You start auditing. And these aren't just numbers. These are activities. So you got to get away from the numbers, guys. And you got to go into your mind and you got to see a picture of all the bells and whistles and the wheels turning within the company. And I might say, for me to sell 300 month, units a month, no, I'm going to have to hire somebody. I may have to pay them a thousand a month, right? Well, if I pay them a thousand a month, look what just happened. I'm down to 590. So here's the new question, guys. For me to sell 300 units, I got to sell, I got to hire somebody. I'm back down. So how many units would I have to sell to afford to hire somebody? Well, I may have to sell about what, 500? I'm just guessing numbers. I'm just putting the spreadsheet. Um, 400. So I'm going to have to sell 100 more a month. But wait a minute. Is that amount of marketing, 120, going to do it? No, I'm going to have to double that, 240. That's not going to do it. So you see, then I got to go, well, how many units do I need to sell? Well, then I turn and go, wait a minute. I got to sell so many units. I got to hire somebody. I got to put more marketing. Now I got to do this wait a minute, wait a minute, is there a better idea? So you look at, this is called scenario planning. This is what I say by you look at it on paper for scenario planning. So I say, okay, I think I could probably sell 200 units per month on my own with this marketing. What if I just change the selling price by $1? Well, look, I'm up to 1,090. I just increased my gross profit by 50%. So you, when you understand that you can possibly get away with a dollar more or 50 cents more, any changes to the selling price goes right down to the net income, right down to the bottom line. So what I do is I see, here's where I want to do a storytelling, guys. This is all I was trying to do is demonstrate something so I could do a story and explain something. I see where immediately people see a demand in the marketplace. They put their head down. They go, we got to hire. We got to do this. This is commonplace. And then they end up hiring all these people and they end up where the employees are making more money than they are. They have eliminated their ability to make net income because they didn't ask, how many people do I have to hire to produce those sales? How much marketing? Then how many sales do I have to produce? Is it better if I just increase the price, lower the demand? So what I'm telling you is there's no right or wrong answer, but what you want to do is you want to first look at everything on paper. You want to look at what is it on paper and you want to look at all the possible scenarios. Then you want to walk away from that experience where you're just looking at it on paper. You're not saying, well, the market will do this or this won't. Then you go into another phase where you go, well, what's realistic with the marketplace? Then you come back and you put it in the, the model. Now, this is a very simple model. My models would be a little bit more elaborate, but you can see what I'm doing is and this is what I would do as a CFO turnaround. I would examine what some scenario would look like in paper, and I would spend a day working with the paper, and I would look at all the different options, and I would record them. Well, if my selling price is this, and this happens, and this happens, then what I would do as I would look into the marketplace and I would assess from a strategic perspective, a marketing perspective, what the feasibility of those possibilities are. And then I would go back to my model and plug in new numbers. And the relationship I had between the models that looked at the 
whole alignment of the business structure and the marketplace was an ebb and flow I was always in. And this is how bigger companies operate. This is why you hear things like on Walmart or on Wall Street. I mean, we beat the street by a penny or we did this. By because someone is looking at this all throughout, and this is why I say to you guys the word course corrections. Okay, this is where the word course corrections come from. This is where looking at monitoring your numbers, this is where knowing your numbers comes from. All of the things you hear me say again and again that was a really minor model to demonstrate, but I'm hoping that in seeing it, even if you didn't follow everything I say, it's like, okay, I get that there's a way. And this goes back to kind of my personal story again, is when I was younger and had my own company, I have my own company now, but this is you know kind of back in those days, is that I would go to bed constantly wondering, am I profitable? Am I making the right decisions? You know all of these different questions and I wouldn't know the answer to them and once I figured out that you could create models that did scenario planning you could look at the marketplace and see what is feasible you could come back and input those numbers then you could go back and do course corrections it made me feel more in control of my future. Not only does it help and you make, you know, you know what's going on financially, but just emotionally, it felt more in control. Okay. So that is how I would use those models. Now, Robert, you said you had to, you, you thought you had to use accrual accounting. If you have material inventories, you said that small businesses under 26 million have to use cash accounting. Am I sure? Yes, I am sure, Robert. So you are correct though. It's just a little bit more step in the understanding, Robert. So what you said is correct. And what I said is correct. How could that be right? Well, if you look at what you said, you do have to use accrual accounting for material inventories, but you're not using accrual accounting for everything else. So let me explain. In fact, let me pretend I use cash accounting for accrual inventories. I get to December 31st, right? And I find out I owe this huge tax bill. And I go, oh, I don't want to pay that much in taxes. And I'm going to need any of the inventory anyway. So I purchase a ton of inventory so I could take it all off on a cash basis, right? And then I can lower my tax bill. Oh, no. The IRS doesn't want you to do that. So they force you to use material inventories on an accrual basis where the tax preparer at the end of the year always ask you, well, um, how much do you have left in inventory? How much did you pay for it? And they put that on the tax return under your inventory. But that doesn't mean all your accounting is in accrual and you're not doing the accrual counting on your internal reports. You're just providing that information to the accountant at the end of the year. So how accrual accounting works in a, a software system that's set up and a bookkeeping department that does it is every time a unit is sold and it goes on the income statement when services are rendered independent of whether it's paid or not, it uses the term services rendered. So if I render the service, if I ship the product, the amount that I sold it for is immediately going to go on the income statement. It's not going to stay off it like it does in cash until it goes to the bank, okay? And then at the same time, the cost for that a unit sold goes on the income statement and cost of goods. These are driven internally by a bunch of accounting um, documents that you use. It's PO driven. So when the amount goes over for the sell, the PO picks up the cost and it goes over. So yes, we both are right in essence, Robert. Everybody under 26 million is required to do cash accounting, but you're also required to announce your inventories on what you purchased, when you purchased, because the IRS does not not want to use you to use that to lower your taxes. So hopefully that made sense. Excellent question, Robert. Great question. I get asked that quite a bit as I talk about it because it is a, a bit of confusion. Absolutely. So Christine, how do you figure out the relationship of the expense and the marketing and the amount of units sold? Beautiful question, Christine. Beautiful question. Oh, I love this question. I'm going to go back Back to my spreadsheet to tell you, okay? So let me go back to my spreadsheet. This is an awesome question. Guys, I love this question because of the fact that it really does pick up on when people invest in a bunch of social media. Now you're gonna give me a second here. I'm gonna stop my video. My air conditioner came on. It's driving me up a wall with the noise and I'm gonna just turn it off. Okay, so 
Let me come back here now. I'm going to come back and you can see me again. So let's go back to Christine's perfect question. Okay. So let's pretend, I love this one. I, I'm okay. I'm going to stop telling you how much I love this one because this is a key point for everybody to understand. Especially during pandemic, people were spending a lot of money on social media and they were spending money on all of this to increase in the marketing. Now, I am not saying marketing's not good. Marketing that's effective is good. I'm saying not understanding what the actual return on the marketing is not good. That's what I'm saying to clarify. So what would happen is that um, a lot of the marketers, what they do is they gauge it on how many more units were sold, or you might gauge it on how much the revenue increased, but that is not the number you can base it on. So I'm going to increase this marketing in this just by a large amount from 120, and I'm going to I'm going to increase increase it a, a huge dollar amount so you can see what I'm talking about, right? You can see the change. So let's go like 600. Let's go 600. If I suddenly spend marketing of 600 and my benchmark was 1500, you can see, first of all, the reduction from the 600 from 120, you know, the reduction in the net income of the increase in marketing was 610, right? So I had 120 I spent on marketing. I was close to my benchmark with a thousand. Let me put a number of units in here so we can get this kind of caught up to my benchmark. Okay, I'm close to my benchmark. So I sold 250 units. Units, I got my benchmark or I'm pretty close to it, right? But I only have 120 in marketing. So what I decide to do is really put a lot of money into marketing. I spend 600 on marketing, right? Now I'm down to 1,000 only. I'm way off my benchmark. I got to get up by 500, right? So I can look at the marketing and say, how many additional units did I sell? Well, let's say I sold 50 more units, right? Well, that's 300. I'm not quite there yet. So 50 units sold is not going to be a benefit to the marketing I paid, right? So let's say I sold um, 75 more units. That's going to get me above my benchmark. So you can see how the number of units going back into the overall model tells me where I am in net income. Basically, the rule of thumbs to always follow. If you follow this continuously, you know that net income is what matters, guys, not the revenue, not any of this. It's the net income at the bottom that matters. That's where the money you are getting, money to reinvest, money to grow your company, money to pay your bills, and money to, to have your lifestyle, okay? So that's where the, the numbers really matter. So when you look at the return on the marketing, what you want to be doing is you want to be looking at how many units must be sold at the, fit, the price, right? If you turn around and you discount just to sell the units, that's not going to get you where you need to go. So it's looking at the entire relationship. This is where um, people also go into retail. They end up selling it at a wholesale price. The price goes down, but the cost didn't. And suddenly the retail decision was the worst decision they ever did. Okay. So Basically, any question you can ask, once you put it into that model, it gives you the answer to that, okay? So that is why the model is so important. Lauren, do you got a question? Does somebody else have a question? I have two questions. I have awesome. one from, um, actually from Patricia. She says, what are the exercises required to determine your reasonable annual compensation for your S Corp in California? Gotcha. So that is a complicated calculation that it is my opinion that you should have a tax preparer assist you with. I want to say that. Now I'm going to answer the question, right? But I want to start out by saying that. So what happens is the reasonable salary, so guys that aren't an S corp or tax like an S corp, a reasonable salary is what is a requirement by an S corp by the IRS. And the reasonable salary the IRS describes as, well, it's got to have this, 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 and the other thing. It's really hard to follow the IRS discussions on it. So what happens is there's a precedence that tax preparers follow. And the precedence they follow is to make sure when you get to the bottom line, your net income, so when you know where your net income is going to be or you have an estimate of your net income before year end, guys, this reasonable salary has to be paid before year end. 
what you do is you say, well, I'm going to take 50 to 60 percent as a W-2 salary. So I'm an S Corp. I, I do the same thing internally. So what I do is come November, I'm looking at where I am on a cash basis, guys. We're back to a cash basis now. OK, we're back to financial accounting. See why you have to switch between managerial accounting like I was just speaking and now financial accounting because we're talking tax returns. That's why you got to know the two exist and switch back and forth. So I go through this long process. It takes me hours upon hours to do where I first take the information from my internal accounting. I predict about how much more cash will come in as revenue, you know, what I think is going to be paid by the end of the year, how many more expenses I'm going to pay out by the end of the year. I estimate my net income. I also go through some steps where I go, well, 50% of the meals aren't a deduction, so I'm going to take that out. This is a partial deduction. This is partial use for the car. So I do all these kind of calculations to get an idea that at the end of the year, my net income, I'm making up a number here, is going to be you know $10. That's going to be my net income, $10. Now I'm going to turn around and I'm going to calculate 50 to 60 percent, depending on the comfort and where you want to go. And I'm going to take that as a W-2 salary. So then what I'm going to do is if you got ADP, I do my own. It's crazy that I do all this on my own, but I do. I, I go through and I write a W-2 check. I have counts with all the United States Treasury and eight, all the deposits of that. And so then I'm going to take the 50 percent and I'm going to write it just like a W-2. It's going to be subject to the Medicare, to the Social Security to the unemployment, to the SDI if you're in California, just like you wrote a W-2 and you were an employee. Now, that amount is going to be deducted from my net income, right? And so that's going to lower my net income. And then the net income that's remaining once I do my taxes, that's going to be the K-1. So calculating the salary is really kind of doing a draft, a short, a back of the envelope calculation of what your taxes are going to look like and then getting 50 to 60 percent of that. That's why when I tell people, if you want to be taxed as an S-Corp or start as an S-Corp, but mostly taxed taxes and S corp. You go on all these things and people are like, oh, you can save all this money and you know you should be taxed as an S corp. Once again, it's only a partially true story, guys, because when you're taxed as an S corp, not only do you have more administrative fees and you need professionals to help you because the S corp has to file a separate tax return, you have to have the W-2, you have to calculate the reasonable salary before year end, but you also have to pay in all these extra taxes on the salary that you would not as a LLC or sole prop. So until you get, and this is a rough, don't anybody write this number down and say, Lori says, I'm just trying to explain something. Okay. No, Lori says, but typically until you get a net income, Lauren, did you notice I said net income, net income, till you get a net income, at least 30, 40,000 a couple years in a row, and you're going to stay there, it costs you more to have an S corp than the benefits you get from a taxation perspective, because the IRS doesn't let you flow back and forth. If you define that you're going to be taxed as S corp, you got to stay there five years. So if then suddenly you're not making enough net income, you're paying out the, you know what, which I know there's someone that's in our chat right now that we had this conversation and she knows that she got got down that road she might put a little comment in and share her i'll let you know if she wants to or not so i'm helping people dissolve the s corp because they got involved in it and they found out it's not benefiting them so i think it was patricia that asked that question you could see it's much of a it's interesting because and, and when you talk about tax finance or legal structures there's never a yes or no it always involves so much and that's why I'm always urging everybody to really, uh, this is something I want to get out to you guys with my free time here. I'm really urging everybody, don't get your information off the internet for this. Don't get blogs. Even when a tax preparer writes a blog, they're only writing part of the sentence. This is one of those things where what you don't know can hurt you. You know, when you look at these disciplines, you know, tax, accounting, you know, legal structures, Anyone who talks about it has spent decades in and is is studied and accredited. I mean, I've been in finance and a CFO for two decades. I am an enrolled agent by the IRS. I mean, it's it's you know a lot of ex, a lot of time spent into it. So you just have to be logical and say, well, well, how can somebody just kind of make a sentence about these really complicated things? Do you think the IRS is simple? No. Do you think tax is simple? No. Why would it be explained in a blog so simple?
I asked somebody the other day and they, I said, well, where did you get this information to become this legal structure? And they go, well, it was a class and it was somebody who had a business and she was advising. I go, so a fellow business owner, what is her credentials? And I said to her, I go, I, I know I was being really funny that day. I go, you know what? I was a patient at a dentist and I had a crown put on. So therefore, can I put a crown on your tooth? I got the drill. Let's go. And she laughed. I go, but where's your story any different? This person doesn't have the expertise to talk about your specific financial situation, right? So really take these serious. Don't be, I think the expression is penny wise, pound foolish. Did I get that right? I know you guys will correct me if, you know, I always mess up the, the expressions, right? You don't want to do that with this type of information because it'll come back and bite you in the, you know what, and where all of this has gotten where you can, you know, just become an LLC and just do all this. If you think about it and, and, you know, I'm just telling you straight up guys, if you look at companies like Zoom and QuickBooks and ADP, what do they want you to be? They want you to be a legal structure. They want you to do a W-2. In fact, one of the people took information off ADP that they needed to be an S-corp and a salary. And I'm like, well, ADP wants you to be an S-corp and a salary. So what do you have is a lot of companies whose it's best in their interest for you to do this. And then it just becomes this rumor throughout the small business. And then you get people that come on different blogs and they like to just kind of say, well, you know what? Um, I, I know about this and I'm going to tell you all about that. That, but these these topics are definitely um, much more complicated. Oh, Randy is PC today. Okay. Yes, Patricia, you answered the question and you understand it from firsthand experience. That's funny. That's a joke between me and Randy. Yeah. Okay. I gotcha. I didn't even catch up on that because I didn't see your name when Lauren said Patricia. I want to get Christine's. Do you think in this changing business environment due to advances in technology, a company suffers if they don't have an adequate website these days? Christine, that is a fascinating question too. Now, I, I'm not the, you know, the guru on social media and websites and everything, but I was working on my own website. I'm updating it. And this thought came to mind. You know, back in the olden days when I did my own website, you had it very content rich. It talked everything about the content. And I realized that actually right now, it's not so much about all the content being there as much as getting a feel for something and then taking the next step. So I think that a company does need to have a website. It needs to be as professional and aesthetically pleasing because that's where we get credibility, especially since we're not doing the hand-to-hand -hand thing much anymore, right? So I think a company does suffer if it does not have an adequate website, but I think the adequate website doesn't have to be the coolest, the greatest. It just has to give me a comfort. I need to be able to answer these questions when I go to your website. What is it you do? Why do I want to buy from you? Can I benefit? How do I buy from you? And then to have an overall feeling of comfort. Now, if I have a, a website that's very elaborate, and it's got so much on it, I'm confused and I can't answer those four questions, I'm not going to buy from you. If I go to one that just has a few bits of information, aesthetically pleasing, and I can answer those four questions, I'm going to buy from you. So I think it's really down to, does the website answer the basic four questions? You know, guys, I always tell you the truth is the truth is always the truth. That is like my favorite, favorite saying lately, right? And when we look at technology. In fact, I had the same saying I came up with a very long time ago is don't engage in technology just for technology's sake. And this was when the Macintosh came into play and everybody was doing their brochures on the Mac just to say they did it, but it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. And I'm like, let technology be your slave. Don't be a slave to technology. Ask yourself, does this work? Does this help me to do it better? If we start looking at technology as tools, but the truth is always the truth. We're always trying to answer the same things for a consumer. We're trying to get our accounting correct. And I love that automation needs supervision. This belief that technology or AI is going to take over, I'm sorry, many people will argue with me, but I still think what I got up there in that brain and what I got here in my heart and in my spirit and my essence of being is smarter, faster, and better than any computer they're ever going to invent because the human spirit and the human being is incredible. But we get so caught up in what society tells us we're supposed to be, what we're not, what we're not good enough, what the new fad is. If you just did one thing and took off all of that 
and you allowed all your power to come through, you will start looking at technology as a tool. You will see what it is you can do to play in the world. Now, I don't know if this is a true story, but I keep to it because I like it, that they say that they went to Michelangelo and they asked Michelangelo, how did you take this piece of marble, this just huge piece of marble and chip away and come up with David? How did you do that? And he said, I merely chipped away all that was not. I have spent my entire life with that marble chipping away all that's not. The first part, and maybe we'll have to have a small biz talk and I'll tell you my entrepreneurial journey because I didn't tell you, maybe we'll come there. The first part of my life, I spent putting on what was not. I came from an upbringing where my parents were very smart and very industrious, but they weren't good at believing in themselves. So I got born into the family, which they say we chose, right? So I came into the, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You'll never amount to anything. I came into that family, right? Which I, I really am so happy. I'm like, thank you so much. That was the lessons I need to learn. I appreciate it. If they they say you chose their parents. I did it for a good reason, right? So I spent the first part of my life slapping on all of, well, am I, what should I be? Well, what does society say I should be? What should I achieve? What does society say I should achieve? What does this person say? I spent the bulk of my beginning to my 20s doing that. And then I spent from my 20s on chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, little by little, all that was not Lori. And today, of course, I still got stuff to chip on, but I'm very, very good on playing life dodgeball. If I see some stuff slewed through me, I'm like, oh, miss me, <gasps> miss me, <gasps> miss me. I'm very good at staying in my pure essence. And that's where your power is. And I want to end with this. When I keep saying, take your power back, take your power back, take your power back, going to go over a little bit, Lauren, just to say this, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do this. When I say, take your power back, to the best that I can explain it, this is what I mean. What I started, I hate when my thing does this. Every time I do that, it does it. I don't know why. So I'll have to not do that anymore. When I started this and I showed you the Excel sheets, you notice, Lauren, it was mathematical calculations. It was all about math. And I said, whether whatever you do at the end of the day, you either have a dollar to buy a quart of milk or not. It's all mathematical calculations, right? That's what it is. So there's a 3D monopoly game on planet Earth that we are still playing that's about mathematical calculations. Business is going to be about that. Salaries are going to be about that. It's not changing the math. Mathematical calculations are there, but how you create that mathematical calculation that works for you, that's where the pure essence of creativity comes from. If you say, I got to be this kind of an entrepreneur because this is what's being said I should be, and it says I should be an LLC because that's the Gucci bag, and I should have employees because that means I'm a real business. Remember, I said, what, what's a real business, guys? That's what is got to be chipped away from your block. When you get that out of your head and you say, there's a mathematical calculation that I need in my life based on my personal bills, based on what I desire, based on my goals, all that stuff. There's a number. There's a number. Where can I get that mathematical calculation? Is it this business model? Is it that business model? Okay, I could have this business model with 10 employees, but is that what I want? No, I don't want that. Okay, not that business model. Can I do this business model? There are millions upon millions way to make money. But at the end of the day, there is certain things that said, well, if you want to make this, maybe you have to do something different than walk dogs, okay? If you want to be in finance, it's going to be a little bit more complicated, but you'll get this. So there's certain truisms about the economics. But what there isn't truisms about is these things that you hear that, well, you don't make money in the first year, and oh, you got to have employees to grow, and you got to be big enough so you can sell it. Those are not truisms. And so if you chip away all of of that noise and you just say, what does me, the spirit, want to experience? What me does the business person want to do? What skills do I realistically have? What realistically am I willing to invest in time and resources? And you start with a clean slate, you will find the right business model. And when it doesn't work, you do a course correction. If it's not supporting you, you create a new business model. You are not your company. 
You are not responsible for all the employees always having a job. You are not responsible for any of that. If you look at and say, what makes me feel with joy? What makes me feel creative? What makes me feel alive? The rest will follow. But you can't just go, I'm going to feel alive and enjoy. It's going to happen. It's a mathematical equation as well. So if we take a dose of the power of the being and the mind and the intention and the spirit and all those things, and then we take in this with reality and numbers and business and what works and doesn't, and we blend the two together, we can find what works for us and we can be a important, crucial cog in the wheel personally and business in this whole thing we call the world and existence on planet earth. So when I say take back your power, I'm saying chip off all of that stuff you're hearing out there about what you should be. Don't should all over yourself, okay? Bring in what you want to be. Be realistic about the math and what works and doesn't work and bring it all together, okay? And be aware, awake, and conscious. That's the one thing, if I can say, be aware, awake, and conscious. If it doesn't make sense and that gut says it doesn't make sense, it probably doesn't make sense for real. Facts matter, guys. Okay, I know I went over. I Hopefully this was something. I know I was all over today, guys. I didn't know what I was going to do. Hopefully you come away with some information. You come away with an aha. Uh -huh. If anything, I hope I at least made you think, well, maybe I should know my numbers. Maybe there's another way to look at it. Maybe I can use these as tools. Maybe I can have some more freedom in my life. And maybe I can sleep better at night and wake up in the morning refreshed because I feel more in control. Maybe I can ask myself, how do I take my power back? So with that, Lauren, I'm going to throw it back to you. Hopefully I was as good as, or at least close to some of our guests. I don't know. <laughs> you know what, Lori, I think that's like a mere understatement, the word good. Like this <laughs> show was amazing. There's so many comments in the chat. Um, I took down the uh, be aware, awake and conscious. And then also the don't shit all over yourself. <laughs> uh, as you know, I'm a digital marketer by heart. And so- <laughs> Those are definitely going to be two <laughs> quotes that go up on my timeline this week. <laughs> I will, of course, accredit you, but that, I mean, it was, it was really, really good. Really good. Thank you. I know at the end of the day, life should be fun. That's the only shit I want you to do. It should be fun. And, and <laughs> you know, get out of your own way and um, be smart and have fun. And that's what it's yeah. about. So next um, week, we've got a runner up to me because we got two excellent, excellent entrepreneurs coming on with a lot of energy and a lot of spunk, a lot of years younger than me. They got the energy younger than me, right? Um, but anyway, guys, we'll have another one of these. I think maybe we should have one or more. And uh, I will pick up where I end. I will tell you my entrepreneurial journey. And I'll tell you what I decided to do nine years ago that made a major difference in my life. Uh, you'll hold that, baby, okay, Laura? No, we'll I love it. Hey, so, audience, you guys make sure she, we, yeah, you help I, me hold her to it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I will tell you some behind the scene things that um I haven't told you guys that will be quite interesting and, and help you to understand where my perspectives come from, how I managed to get able to chip the rest of that off. Okay, I, I will make sure I come back and tell you about it. Okay, with that, you guys, I just love you guys to death. I have so much fun with this show. I really really do. I, I thought when I suggested the SBDC, as I told you, Lauren, we were going to do it six months, right? It was going to be my little play thing for six months, right? And here we are, what, two years? I don't even know, right? We've been at it for some time. So it, it's really turned into a blessing. And what I love the most is the support that you guys give each other in the chat. I love that aspect of it. Okay. If you need to get in touch with me, you want to get in touch with me, please. If you liked what I showed you with that model, that model comes from financial literacy session number two. Okay. That's where it comes from. I didn't even go. Oh, I hate that, that it does it. Every time I do that, the balloons come up. I, I have got to figure out. I told somebody the other day, Laura, and I was having this discussion about bankruptcy. I go, you got two options and the freaking balloons come up. That's oh, not no. when you want balloons coming up. Okay. I got, I, I don't know. I turned jesters off, but yeah, if I go this way or if I got to like, don't do those. Okay. I'm out of here. Lauren's staying after. She's going to collect yeah, no, no, no. information, yeah, how to no, get no, in touch no, with me or anything no, no, you need no, no. to know. Thank
thank you for being my audience today and helping me to fill in the show. Bye, everybody. Bye, Lori. Thank you. All right, everyone, direct your attention over to the chat. I think it's Patricia. You'll see that I put my email in there one more time. Um, that's a conversation I think you can have with Lori or just get in contact with the uh, SBDC in general. Um, I also have a link to our YouTube playlist where you can see past shows. And I think I've got it. Um, honestly, thank you to all of you who have joined us. You guys make the show exciting um, and you make us come back every single week. Um, so thank you. Uh, and keep coming back, please. Um, with that, have a beautiful Wednesday. Have a wonderful remainder of the week, a great weekend. And we will see you next week, Wednesday at 10 a.m. for another session of Small Biz Talk Solutions for your small business. Bye. Take care.